Mid-morning buying interest faded in the grain markets with soy futures leading the way to the downside and wheat futures holding on to just modest gains. Corn was pulled slightly lower by the drop in beans. Lean hog futures gave up early gains while the cattle complex surged to the upside. Live, enriched with delicious surging beef via Farm Journal broadcast, this is AgriTalk. This afternoon, it's a conversation with Luke Beckman from Central Valley Ag. Directly following the news, Matt Bennett from agmarket.net. I'm the handsome newsman, Davis Michelson. Now, the host of AgriTalk, Chip Lorre. All right, Davis, hey, thank you so much. I almost said the feeder cattle continued the stampede, and then I thought, no, that's too easy. Huh? I, I, I just I, I just figured that was too easy. I didn't want to do that. Didn't want to little do on that. the little on the nose, as they say. Right, right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Welcome to Agri Talk. I'm Chip. That's Davis. Uh, you know, really yeah. impressive moves that we're seeing in this cattle complex. There's there's no question about it. Um, just the upside momentum is, momentum is there. But when it gets as aggressive as it has been for the past three sessions, you start to wonder just how much longer can this last. Uh, but mm-hmm. uh, we'll we'll uh, discuss that a little bit more at the end of the show. We got Luke, Luke Beckman, Central Valley yeah. Egg over in Elgin, Nebraska on the show today. We'll we'll talk about how that crop finished up over there in eastern Nebraska and and which directions it's going? What? what mm-hmm. uh, how is that crop, both corn and soybean crops, being used up over there uh, this yeah. year? This year's so. good. Good. How you doing? Everything okay? Well, the neighbor's out in the driveway right now fixing his fence. <laughs> yeah. And he was going to come up a little short, and I, oh, no. I yelled over, "Hey, you want to borrow my board stretcher?" And he said, <laughs> "Yeah, maybe, maybe later." I don't think he knows what I was talking about. I don't think he knows either. <laughs> ah, town folk. Town oh, folk. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. That's good stuff. We got Matt coming up here in just a little bit. Let, let's go ahead and get to the markets. Well, Chip, geopolitical tensions and the escalation of the war in Ukraine supported wheat prices, although wheat did close well below session highs. Price pressure was credited to improvement in USDA's hard red winter wheat crop condition ratings and reports that, despite the ongoing war with Russia, Ukrainian farmers could find a way to increase winter wheat production by more than 10% from a year ago to a potential 25 million metric tons. Wheat futures still have upside momentum, but December SRW futures ran into resistance at the late October lows near 558. December HRW wheat futures three cents higher, five fifty-eight and one quarter. December spring uh, soft red wheat up two and one half cents to five forty-nine and three quarters. Chip, what does your screen say there on the spring wheats? Anything at all? Yeah, you know what? I'm just hit the refresh on it here. It's the last trade, five eighty-six and three quarters up one and three quarters. All right, very good. You betcha. Well, we provided spillover support for the corn market, but that support fell apart after markets posted a mid-morning high. Without fresh export news, enthusiasm for higher prices has drained from the market, even with professional trading funds still on the long side of the market. The lack of a supply-side scare from South America also allowed corn prices to ease to the downside. December corn futures spiked resistance at 430 and then fell back to close near session lows. December corn futures were two cents lower, 427 and one quarter. March corn down two cents, 437 and three quarters. July corn futures close at 448 and one half. That's down a penny and one half, Chip. It kind of feels like this Dees corn is setting up for a period of trade right around that 430 level. Well, Chip, the lack of a crop scare out of South America weighed more heavily on the soy complex than it did on corn futures. Pro farmer crop consultant Dr. Michael Cordonier from Soybean and Corn Advisory added 1 million metric tons to his Brazilian bean crop estimate to reflect quick planting progress the past three weeks. That puts the Brazilian bean crop at 166 million metric tons. Brazil's largest soybean crush association says the country will grow 167.7 million tons of beans this year. January soybeans opened near session highs and spiked resistance at yesterday's high before falling back to close low range. January beans 11 and one quarter cents lower, 998 and a half. 
March beans down ten and a half to ten oh eight and one half. July beans closed at ten thirty three and a half, down nine and one quarter cents. Chip. No help from the product markets today either. December soybean meal down one dollar seventy cents to eighty eight sixty, and December soybean oil down sixty eight points to forty four eighty four. Well, December cotton today was twenty seven points higher at sixty six eighty nine. On your livestocks, heavyweight choice graded boxed beef values surged another buck twenty three this morning on good movement of ninety three loads. That helped raise expectations of steady cash trade. November fat cattle filled the November 8 downside price gap and closed near session highs. The rally in feeder cattle futures stayed red hot. Jan feeders have erased the price slide since the end of July and have rallied more than $29 from the September 9th low. Two. December fat cattle today up $2.47 and one half cents to 186.57 and a half. February futures up 202 and a half to 188 even. In January feeder futures two dollars fifty cents higher to two fifty two. And on the snout side, December lean hogs posted a high range open and a low range close and traded on both sides of eighty bucks for a fourth consecutive session. December hogs today forty seven and one half cents lower at seventy nine fifty five. The February contract down forty cents, eighty two, eighty seven and one half. Chip Flory. All right. Thank you very much, Davis. Matt Bennett, agmarket.net, joins us right now. How you doing, Matt? I'm doing good, buddy. How are you? Doing real fine. Well, you know what? The markets felt good and been morning. Then the support just kind of drained away. Beans seem to be struggling the most in here, don't they? Yeah, they do. It just seems like beans are having a hard time building any sort of momentum whatsoever. You know, this corn market. I'm afraid that we lost him. I thought it was looks it, like it, but he's still there. He's still hmm. there. Are you still there, Matt? Can you hear me? One nine five talked about. I think both you and I would have been a little perplexed, but uh, you know, you come in here today, back off just a little bit. Maybe we do stay around four thirty chip, but at the same time, you're getting into option expiration. I think these spreads could get a little wonky, you know, as you get closer to delivery. Okay, okay, that was on corn. You broke up some when we when you were giving us your take on what's happening in the soy complex. Give me yeah. that again. Yeah, I mean, I think when it comes down to beans, it's just you've got so many beans out there. It's tough, you know. Whenever you look at South America, there's no major weather issue. If you're asking for a rally, you got to be kind of praying for Argentina to stay warm and dry, but they are planting. It's kind of what you want this time of year, but La Nina would suggest maybe there could be a weather story later, so... Uh, you're going to need a weather story, though, Chip, because there's so many beans planted. I mean, gosh, there's a plethora of beans in the U.S., plethora of beans in the world. Yeah, yeah, there is. There is. It's going to take a little time to to work through those supplies. Real quick, just give me your take on what's happening in cattle. It's an impressive trade so far this week. Super impressive trade. You know, I don't think cattle on feeds expected to be super friendly, but some of these cash prices have some of these cash prices, ha and we lost him again. Well, that was Matt Bennett. He is, Ag he is as chaste as he is wise. Yes, yes. Yes, yeah. That feeder cattle cash market Get myself is. myself protected. Get yourself yep, protected. there he is. There he is. All <laughs> right, we got to hop. Thank you, Matt. Matt Bennett, agmarket.net. Coming up next, Luke Beckman, Central Valley Ag, right here on AgriTalk. Do you suffer from talking on the radio phobia? No problem. Send us a tweet at hashtag AgriTalk. Welcome back to AgriTalk. I'm Chip. Glad you're with us on this Tuesday afternoon for AgriTalk. Um, let's go out to northeast Nebraska and get the conversation started with Luke Beckman, Central Valley Ag, Elgin, Nebraska. Luke, it's good to talk to you again. How are you? Hey, gentlemen, doing well. Thanks for having me on. We just had a rain event sweep across most of Nebraska, Kansas, here the last 24, 48 hours. So I think everybody's feeling pretty good about that. Yeah, yeah. And it was not an insignificant rain as, as, as I watched it roll across there. It hung around for a little bit, didn't it? 
Chip, there is no rain that is insignificant in the Western <laughs> Corn Belt. We'll take all of it. Uh, yeah, it was uh, it was well received. It was it was an all day type event. So, uh, really excellent moisture in that system, and uh, has has the recharge started. Uh, we'll need yeah. to get things filled back up. It was a tough tough finish to the end of the growing season out west. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Um, beans seem to take the end of the growing season worse than corn out your way. Is that fair to say? I would agree with that. Uh, although still probably surprised with the lack of moisture we did receive late, how well some of the non-irrigated soybeans did perform. Uh, the one thing about a dry finish to the year is we really kept uh, plant disease low in the soybeans. We typically fight, you know, some sudden death and some white mold, especially in your irrigated acres. And uh, the very dry air the last half of the growing season uh, was probably beneficial to the soybeans. So maybe what we lacked in moisture, we kind of kept those yield hits, you know, from a from a high disease type year away from us this year. Um, so net net. Uh, soybean production up in Nebraska, of course, uh, with the better moisture profile coming into the year, um, and probably one of our best soybean production years we've had, uh, you know, out of the last several. Sounds to me like you're talking that Nebraska bean yield up a little bit there, Luke. Is that right? Absolutely. I've felt that way since we've seen, you know, USDA state level estimates uh, late summer, you know, in the upper 50s, and it just felt like we were tracking Better than that, and once we saw uh, combines roll across the fields and just looking at, you know, what we've dumped at the elevators and just what producers mm -hmm. have said, it just feels like the USDA is just a little bit light on the Nebraska number. Um, okay. You know, they're, they're in the uh, upper 50s, and I think Nebraska is probably closer to a 61. They're 59 today, so uh, maybe okay. a couple bushels light on Nebraska. Wow. Okay. All right. What about corn? You kind of feel the same way or no? Corn was really variable yield-wise in Nebraska. I made the comment about disease in the soybeans kind of being better this year just with the dry finish. was not that way in the corn. This is probably one of the heavier disease years we've had. Um, I think just with a lot of moisture early, caused a lot of stress early in the growing season. Uh, so the big, the big talking point this fall with producers was that fungicide paid in a really big way. Um, and it really showed up if you didn't use it. Uh, so we had a lot of variability in corn yields overall, you know, things certainly much better uh, with the non-irrigated acres performing well compared to the last several years. Um, I don't think we quite have a record uh, corn production number in Nebraska. Uh, it's a good crop, but USDA has us at a 194 today. Uh, maybe that's a bushel high, bushel or two high, uh, in my opinion. Okay. Yeah, that we're talking fine tuning at that point. Uh, uh, but going from a fifty nine to a sixty one in beans would be more a little bit more than fine tuning. Just might take. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, maybe a little bit of work to do there. What about the moisture in the crop? I, I mean, we heard it from Ohio, I, I, and I would assume out to Nebraska that uh, corn and soybeans came out of the field exceptionally dry. Very much the case here, yes. Uh, yeah. You know, just dry, arid air all through August and September, uh, really with no reprieve, uh, with moisture and just the humidity levels were very low. So, yeah, we had a really dry uh, receipts here at the elevator. Um, and just looking at data for us, you know, going back a couple of years, I mean, this is this is the driest crop that we've dumped Um in the records that I'm seeing. So, I mean, you're talking like a two point difference in corn just compared to last year and maybe not quite that much in beans. So it's pretty significant, you know, when you see the average inbound moisture that low uh, across the yeah. system. So it was an, it was an easy crop to put away. Um, if we would have had, you know, a crop that was wetter, especially with some of the performance oh, issues that we saw with the, with the railroads, um, the export program not being that robust, it would have been, it would have been a challenge to get this crop put away this year. And that's what we were anticipating all through uh, the summer and last half of summer. And uh, I think the, the drier crop made it a lot simpler to uh, get the crop put away this year. Yeah. Yeah. Sped things up there. No doubt. No doubt. Does that lower moisture, does that pull down yield? 
I mean, you get paid on weight. Water is weight. Uh, it mm-hmm. seems like it, it should be registered as, as uh, you know, less volume per acre. Well, certainly less weight per acre that the producer is, you know, able to capture and get paid for, you know, if you're allowed to be um, allowed to deliver 15 moisture corn, you know, into the marketplace and you're delivering 12 moisture corn, you know, you're missing out on uh, over 3% if you do the shrink factors uh, of weight that you'd otherwise be paid for. So the, the producer is certainly being impacted. Now, the question I've asked different people across the industry, how does a bushel of 12 moisture corn uh, impact a feed ration? Or how does a 12% moisture bushel of corn impact the ethanol yield? Uh, same conversation for, you know, soybeans at 9% compared to 11 going through a, a soybean processing plant. So I think for, at a processing level, what I've heard is they actually like the drier uh, bushels. They're, they're paying for less water um, as it comes through those facilities. Um, so as far as an energy content in those, in those bushels, um, I don't know. That's my big question is, is, does it really change things in terms of consumption? No doubt the producer is being paid less, um, but it's water weight that they've lost and, um, how impactful is it to our national production? I don't know that it's, I don't know that it's large enough to uh, impact the numbers or the balance sheet. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We're going to have to pay attention on the usage side there for sure. But, uh, you know, dry matter and, and energy and, and everything, I don't, it, it will be interesting to see how it is all impacted and, and plays a role in here. You mentioned some some rail issue. What was going on with the rail? Uh, we had the the embargo, Mexican embargo going on um, okay. at, at yes, Eagle yes. Pass. And so rail freight really wasn't moving that well. Um, you know, and the export program wasn't particularly – robust either. And so what we saw typically, you know, in the Western Corn Belt, we don't have the river system uh, like we do out in the Eastern Corn Belt. And so a lot of your export book, you know, necessitates that we load that on rail and it gets moved to the Pacific Northwest or, you know, the center Gulf, U.S. Gulf, or directly into Mexico. Um, And that those programs just weren't real robust this year. And so we saw a lot of soybeans uh, backed up into corn space this year. Uh, So it really required uh, the elevator system to get a little bit creative with, um, you know, trying to tuck that crop away. We saw a lot of grain on the ground uh, where typically it would have been, uh, you know, loaded on shuttles and shipped out of here. So uh, the export program out of, out of the Western Corn Belt this year was certainly less than what we are accustomed to. Okay. Has there been much improvement on that? Absolutely. Yeah. I think the system Good. has, um, you know, we saw some export business come in. We've seen the the flash sale type numbers. Um, yeah. Sometimes you get logistics to loosen up and your freight values fall uh, and it makes, uh, you know, puts you in a position to uh, get those beans off the ground or get them out of corn space and get those right. things shipped. So situation right. has improved yeah. um, just as the export sales in China has been a more active buyer of beans here the last month. Yeah. Yep. What did, what did it all do to the basis trade there in, in Eastern Nebraska? I would say basis was generally supportive during harvest. And I think you see that in years where we have pretty good carries, you know, in your, in your future spreads. Um, if you're an elevator or commercial, you know, if you have space, you want to fill it um, in a carry market. And so uh, generally the marketplace was pretty firm trying to make sure that that was happening. Uh, we also had a new crush plant, you know, in Northeast Nebraska that opened up this year. And uh, that's that's just a new dynamic for everybody to kind of settle in and get used to how that's going to operate. So it was generally a pretty competitive uh, marketplace on the basis side, even though, uh, you know, rail freight was not performing well at all. Um, Gotcha. And it's continued to trek higher here as we've gotten out of harvest. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I want to talk more about that new crush facility. I want to talk more about the domestic corn demand. Uh, specifically ethanol, corn for ethanol demand. Uh, and th- let's talk balance sheets. What is some of the changes that we might see between, you know, af- after we got the updates in November? We're talking with Luke Beckman, Central Valley Ag, right here on AgriTalk. Um, 
Let's go to the markets page at profarmer.com and check today's closes, where December HRW wheat futures were three cents higher at 558 and a quarter. December SRW wheat up two and one half cents to 549 and three quarters. December corn futures were two cents lower at 427 and a quarter. March corn down two cents, 437 and three quarters. January soybean futures were 11 and one quarter cents lower at 998 and one half. March beans down 10 and a half to 1008 and one half. December cotton today was 27 points higher at 6689. On your livestock, December fat cattle up two dollars 47 and one half to 18657 and a half. January feeders two dollars 50 cents higher to 252. And December lean hog futures 47 and one half cents lower. At 79.55, get more, visit tryprofarmer.com. Nebraska. Luke, you mentioned that new crush facility there in the area. Uh, how, what's, how many beans are, is that place going to take? I believe that's a 35 million bushel crush okay. plant per year. All right. You know, so you're talking, what, 100,000 a day type, right. type plant. Yep. Right. So has have you noticed the impact of, of that? of the opening of that plant in the cash market? Sure. I think, I think, uh, neighboring, um, neighboring grain facilities, elevators, other, other crush plants, um, aware of it. I think we were just in a competitive environment this year to, uh, you know, protect turf, if you will, as you get a new player in the neighborhood, everybody yeah. wants to, uh, kind of settle into how things are going to be, but it may be hard to analyze that too, just because our soybean production in the Eastern third of Nebraska was just so much different um, than it was last year or the year prior. I mean, we just had okay. two tough crops, you know, the last two years. Right. Um, so it was really nice to have a good crop this year as we do uh, experience crush expansion in Nebraska. We've got another facility coming online uh, next fall, 2025. That facility has uh, recently started to post uh to arrive soybean bids, you know, for harvest of 25. Uh, so it's going to happen again next year uh, as we see crush expansion continue to, to ramp up. I think the other thing, you know, that we're watching and hearing from our producers is just what's the, what's the farmer mentality um, around that? Are they going to change, you know, how they operate? I think we're starting to see uh, some producers uh, put more soybeans on farm. Um, I think you'll see a little bit of that happen as we go forward okay. um, with a portion you know, of, of their soybean crop. Okay. All right. Gotcha. Gotcha. Let's talk about the balance sheets, corn and soybeans. Uh, we got what we got from USDA in the November update. When you look at either corn or soybeans, do you anticipate many changes going forward? I do. I, in the November report, uh, I really expected that we would start to see USDA acknowledge a strong start to the uh, export year. For the United States, uh, we saw a pretty active period of export sales. Shipments are running ahead of pace as well. Uh, so really feel like the corn number on the balance sheet has room to grow. Uh, and I think they'll acknowledge that in time as we go forward. Uh, the cash markets are telling you that if we look at the way that the spreads have behaved. Um, you know, we were out to 18 cents for quite a while between decent March futures, and that's come into 10 um, you know, here today. And so that's a sign that demand is is really robust relative to supply. And that's in the midst of a massive crop out east, you know. So, I mean, I think that's pretty telling uh, that demand in corn is just really quite good. Um, and that's, that's exactly what we want to hear, um, you know, with the size of the crop that we grew this year. So I do expect uh, corn exports to grow over time. I think they're in a position to probably do that in the December report uh, to some degree. Um, and okay. I do think ethanol is is running a bit ahead of pace as well. So okay. um, we might see some tweaks higher in that over time as well. Are margins pretty good on ethanol in eastern Nebraska? Uh, they're not great. Uh, we're above okay. break even today in terms of net returns, but it's pretty marginal. Um, 
I think as you get into Northwest Iowa, that gets worse. Uh, as far as the markets that we serve, uh, that's a very competitive area. You're dealing with um, a lot of demand in Northwest Iowa, and then you had crop production issues uh, really along the Northwest Iowa, yeah. Southwest Minnesota border. Um, so we're a little bit deficit up there in terms of corn production, and and I think your ethanol margin environment is definitely worse uh, in that part okay. of the world. All right. So take it to the bottom line. How much of an impact can we see on corn carryover? Well, I believe we can cut 150 million bushels off of our carryout, um, you know, if we keep the production number the same. Uh, so we can really get, you know, the the number under 1.8. I think, you, you know, a number at 175 is certainly conceivable. Um, so generally speaking, I think you have to like where corn is priced today and uh, certainly possible to see front month corn, I think, get to 450. Uh, okay. I think the challenge for us is just, uh, we've got to bring soybeans along for the ride because they are, I think, actively working against corn. Uh, just a very different story there. And I think it sets us up for, uh, you know, more corn acres next spring and uh, okay. fewer soybeans. Uh, in a significant way on those acreage changes? Oh, I don't I don't know about that. I mean, you're talking okay. maybe a, a, you know, a couple million uh, one yeah. way or the other. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't think we go back to the, the trade war type transition where it was a 10 million acre haircut, right. you know, from beans uh, in the upper eighties to the upper seventies. I don't think we see that. Right. Okay. The, the bottom line on soybeans for the current marketing year, not the 25, 26, but the 24, 25, uh, where, where do you see that carryover headed there? Well, I mean, it, it was, you know, constructive to see things improve last month yeah. just with the, you know, the production cut. Uh, it's going to have to come from a production revision. You know, I think if we see that continue to improve, I'm just not optimistic that we really see demand change in the soybeans. Uh, you could argue that crush, you know, being cut 15 million bushels uh, in the November revision was probably premature. Um so I'm curious to watch that one. I'm really curious to see, you know, we've got so many potential changes coming with the new administration around policy and green energy. Um, but I have to think that the UCO imports into the U.S. are probably going to get uh, squashed at some point. I just don't yeah. think a Trump administration would would look favorably upon that. Um, so that can maybe cru uh, help the crush environment and, and maybe we see that number grow. But from an export standpoint, really just not optimistic that we see that grow this year. Okay. All right. It sounds to me, it, well, you said it on corn, that front month contract, I would assume you're thinking maybe the March contract could get up into that 450 range. But with with the amount of corn that still has to move out there, the, the farmer selling is going to be there and waiting for it, isn't it? I think so. You know, I think velocity in terms of how quickly we get to those yeah. price levels is always part of that story, though. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yep. Producers, you know, maybe we'll sell it initially, but um, our friendly producer tends to get pretty bullish pretty quick uh, as prices advance. So uh, they'll sell it in chunks depending on how quickly we get there. Um, but certainly, yeah, a lot of, lot of unpriced uh, grain in inventory uh, by the producer. And the interesting thing to watch is you have to have a buyer on the other side of that. We know consumptive demand is pretty good, but the interesting one is to watch manage money. You know, and that's been the okay. transition from August until today where we've seen, uh, you know, the managed money crowd go net long, you know, over 100,000 contracts as of last Friday's commitment of traders report. Um, so what's going on with that? You know, I think that's the question to ask. This is the longest they've been shipped since February of 2023. And I think I think that time in February was kind of when we saw uh, the broader marketplace maybe get out of the inflation hedge game. Uh, where they were owning commodities and kind of transitioning out of that story and maybe rotating money back into equities with more velocity. So uh, is, are, are we changing that thought process again as we introduce a new administration? A lot of different geopolitical things that could happen. You know, are we going to see an inflationary environment uh, round two come back if we if we uh, cut taxes and kind of stimulate the economy again? So I think that's uh, one we need to watch okay. and potentially could be friendly to you know, our space. Okay. All right. Luke, when you started talking about the managed money, I threw a decent corn chart up on my screen so that I could look at this return to the spring highs or something like that. <laughs> they, 
they did a lot of buying and we didn't see a whole lot of price action there at all. Absolutely. I'm glad you went there. We, uh, you have to look at the commercial position, you know, against this. And I think, uh, you know, if you go back to the way the commercial position looked all through summer, you know, the producer was in retention mode uh, a lot of last year, last calendar year as we got into spring and summer. Uh, not surprisingly, we were coming off of high prices. Producers were flush with cash. They were in a position to keep grain off the market and wait for higher prices. Uh, that has been the difference, though. The producer moved the 23 crop late last summer, and uh, we've seen a pretty methodical transition of ownership from farmer to uh, on down the supply chain throughout this harvest. And so the commercial position, you know, really the largest short that we've seen since that same time period, February of 2023. Um, so the producer, I feel mentally, has kind of settled back into this price environment is is what that tells me. Um, so as we settle into this new range, if we see managed money continue to uh, trim their short and continue to add longs to the marketplace, you know, how high can we get? And the question is just, yeah, how, how fast of a seller will the producer be um, right. as they would potentially add to their long positions? Right, right. Okay. Just a little over a minute left here, Luke, but I got to ask, uh, what is the role of wheat in all of this? Yeah, the uh, that was the news today, right, with the, yep. the geopolitical tensions in the Black Sea with, you know, the nucle nuclear word being thrown around as, you know, yep. the U.S. supplies some missiles to Ukraine. Um, you know, we've seen these Black Sea headlines for four years now, and uh, it just seems like each time we escalate things in the Black Sea, uh, the response is a little bit more muted, you know, so to see weed up two to three cents today is a little disappointing uh, with that type of headline risk. Um, so I think the market's going to have to see something more than a headline risk to maybe get weed excited. Uh, if we do uh, actually have a threat in the Black Sea and commodities get excited starting with wheat, you'll see spillover uh, strength added to the corn market for sure. Fantastic. All right. Luke, man, great job. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Have a great holiday, and we will uh, we'll talk to you before the crop goes in the ground in the spring, okay? Thanks for having me, guys. Take care. Fantastic. Good work by Luke Beckman, Central Valley Ag out of Elgin, Nebraska, right there. Man, covered a lot of ground. What's going on in the cash market in northeast Nebraska? New crush got the rail situation straightened out moving a little bit more product out to the pnw all good man davis and i'll be right back the chickens have come home to roost find out whose fence they're perched on today on agritalk Welcome back to AgriTalk, everybody. Your pal, Davis Michelson, here with Chip Flory, as always. Yep. Looks like the fencing project next door is ongoing. Oh, He's doing good, man. though. He's getting it. He's okay. getting it. All right. Yeah. Get everything set back up. You know, you can well, reuse broken boards. You just need to uh, anticipate problems later on. And here's the thing. If, if the guy... Yeah didn't raise any objections to the board stretcher thing. What do you suppose the chances right. are he's got one of those little magnets to pick up all the nails that are now in my driveway? You reckon Zero. he's got one of those? Zero. That's kind of where I'm at. That's kind of where yeah. I'm at. Yeah. I've got yeah. one. Good. <laughs> well, that doesn't surprise deploy. me. That well. that does not surprise me. A, a DIY mm -hmm. guy like you? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 A um, couple things here on uh, – I'm, I'm just going to bullet point some of these news items for you really quickly. And let's see, Chip Flory, if you can tell me how these statements are related. Are you ready? Should we try it? Let's Here's try Here's your it. first one. December okay. SRWD futures ran into resistance at the late October lows. Okay? That's number okay. one. December corn futures spiked resistance at 430, then fell back to close near session lows. Not yeah. to be outdone, January beans opened near session highs and, you guessed it, spiked resistance yeah. at yesterday's high before falling back to close low range. Yeah. Um, I like reporting about 
um, resistance being challenged more than I like reporting about support being challenged. Chip, are we <laughs> all three of these markets? This is from the corn, the beans, and the wheat. Little moves at least towards resistance. At least they're seeing resistance. You know what I mean? Yep. Falling back yeah, then, they... sure. But we, yep. you know, there's a. There does seem like an effort was made today. Sometimes you got to knock on a door twice for somebody to come and answer it. You know, that's that's mm-hmm. the way I've always looked at at these markets, especially in in an environment like we're in right now. We're moving up away from some of those those lows that we've posted here recently. The first try at some overhead resistance. Let's give it a shot. If it doesn't yeah. work, okay. Well, the funds are already long. Maybe they're just going to take a little bit of profit out of here out of the first spike of 430. Beyond that, uh, let's see what they want to do with it. Uh, it, yeah. it, uh, it, it's interesting. It is what you can do, though, with, with what we saw in the market today is if you had a price order in place to execute a cash sale when December futures got to 430, you got hit today. Now. Where's your next one? Reevaluate. Mm. Where where are you going to put it? You you know, is it going to be, is it up just a dime? Or as we talked about with Luke, do you be a little bit more patient in here and start thinking, well, you know what? 450 might be in play for that March contract. If that's the case, Uh, put your price order in. Put your price order in. Okay. That's a little different, though, than sitting on the cash and waiting for another nickel. I mean, I was I was completely ready to sell at two forty five, and now we're at two forty five and a quarter. I think I can get two fifty, yeah. or you know, uh, uh, I don't know. No, you're right. That seems I a little scary it. to me. Yeah, yeah, you can go broke, you know, waiting for eleven dollar beans <laughs> yes. when they get to ten ninety nine and you don't sell. Yeah, um, you, you you've got to be willing to make some adjustments in here too. But the thing is, the reason that I'm such a proponent of the of the price orders is because a lot of times when you get into a market like this where the funds are being a little bit more active, especially on the buy side, you can get mm-hmm. a spike in the overnight trade that you, you you that might be there and gone before you know it. But if you've got your price order in place, you'll be there to take advantage of it. Um, when we talk about the Russia Ukraine thing, and I I think Luke Beckman yeah. from uh, Central Valley Ag was was spot on here. It seems like every piece of news um, is just a little bit more blunted coming out of that Black Sea conflict over there. I've got this from this morning's news. I didn't get to it, uh, where uh, Ukraine reportedly carried out a first strike on a border region in Russia using Western supplied missiles. Yeah. Meanwhile, President Vladimir Putin signed a decree allowing Russia to fire nuclear weapons in response to a massive conventional attack. And, Chip, I don't know if you saw this, too, but but I saw Mr. Putin saying, yeah, it's not only who fires the weapons, but if if others are supplying these weapons, now now they're on the playground as well here. And the wheat market thinks that's good for two, three cents. Yeah, crazy, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, Boy, you know, like Luke said, though, we've been dealing with this for four years. Right. Um, if it was four years ago, today would have been a 70 cent move in wheat. Mm-hmm. It, it, you know, because this headline, the headlines that we got today were very similar that caused, you know, to headlines that caused 40, 50, 70 cent moves right. four years ago. Uh, so it, we the, it just become numb to the updates that we are getting even though these updates, in my opinion, Davis, are scarier yeah. every day. Well, that's the thing. Where Where is the fear premium? I feel I, like yeah, I don't know. that has completely drained out what I'm seeing. I'm not seeing a fear premium that's in here in this wheat complex at, call it, five and a half to six bucks-ish. You know, a fear right. premium probably gets a little bit more than that, and yet we still get these little responses you know, yeah. without really building any premium into the futures. Interesting. Right. Right. It, uh, I, I don't have a good answer for you on, on this. It just feels like uh, it, it may be building. But yeah. 
the, the question that you just asked me is why mm-hmm. I've been asking the question, what is wheat's role in the grain markets right now? I've been asking yeah. that of almost everybody for the past three weeks. I just, yep. I've been anticipating that at some point we're going to see one of those 40, 50 cent moves in wheat because of ge- geopolitical tensions in, in, in the Black but Sea. What does it take? What does it take? But I, do, I don't know. I don't know. I, oh. Yeah, I'm not sure. National Weather Service 6, 10-day outlook, November 25th through the 29th. Below normal temperatures, Minnesota, western Iowa, northwest Kansas, and points to the west and north of that. A band of near normal down through Wisconsin, eastern Illinois, northern, in, excuse me, eastern Iowa, northern Illinois. And then above normal temperatures in the eastern belt, we got above normal precip across the Corn Belt. Farmer Forum tomorrow morning here on Agritalk.